Hello there, it's Christy, and I want to present some research that was conducted into gender biases in hiring in the sciences. That's because there's a lot of discussion about what drives the wage gap and what drives women's underrepresentation in STEM. And this is a, in a very good piece of research that did work experimentally to try to get at the causal drivers by testing theories as to how sex differences might be produced based on some subtle gender biases that favor male students. I tried this, I should say, I tried doing this Prezi once before and it was very jumpy and jerky and didn't work very well. I'm going to try it this way and fingers crossed it works a little bit better. Again, the paper that I'm going to be summarizing for you today is entitled Science Faculty's Subtle Gender Biases Favor Male Students. It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences for the United States, and it was approved on August 21st of 2012. Links to the PDF, actually probably links to the article, there's a PDF that goes with it. I'll put that in the description box below so you can read it at your leisure. First thing I'm going to cover is what they covered in their abstract. Despite efforts to recruit and retain more women, a stark gender disparity persists within academic science. And just as a little bit of a background, sorry, I kind of jumped into this without explaining, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover basically verbatim what they talk about in their article, and I'm going to present it to you and occasionally step in and explain things that perhaps might need to be explained if you don't do statistical analyses or these sorts of things. But there's a big chunk of it, the discussion and the conclusion that I don't cover, one for time, and two, because if you find this interesting, you should actually read everything. So in this, I'm not going to paraphrase a lot of what they've said, I've just pulled it out verbatim. So it's kind of like I'm reading the article, but in a way I'm not because I'm thematically organizing it more clearly for a non-specialist audience. When I read the article, I can see very clearly how they've structured it, but I want to make sure that you see how they've set up their case step by step to get to their results and then how they use those steps and those results to get, come to their conclusions. So when I read things out here, I'm, I'm most of the time going to be lifting directly from their article, but I'm not going to say quote every time because it would get annoying. And occasionally when I step out of the role of reader, I'll make a note of that and say, you know, on an aside or in my opinion or those things to separate out my view from what they're being, what is being presented by the authors. Abundant research has demonstrated gender bias in many demographic groups, but has yet to experimentally investigate whether science faculty exhibit a bias against female students that could contribute to the gender disparity in academic science. In a randomized, double-blind study with an N of 200, and, I'm sorry, an N of 127, science faculty from research-intensive universities rated the application materials of a student who was randomly assigned either a male or female name for a laboratory manager position. Faculty participants rated the male applicant as significantly more competent and hireable than the identical female applicant. These participants also selected a higher starting salary and offered more career mentoring to the male applicant. The gender of the faculty participants did not affect responses, such that female and male faculty were equally as likely to exhibit bias against the female student. Mediation analyses indicated that the female student was less likely to be hired because she was viewed as less competent. We also assessed faculty participants' pre-existing subtle biases against women using a standardized instrument and found that pre-existing subtle biases against women play a moderating role, such that subtle bias against women was associated with less support for the female student, but was unrelated to reactions to the male student. These results suggest that interventions addressing faculty gender bias might advance the goal of increasing the participation of women in science. To sum up before moving on, stepping out of the role of reader, the article looks at the, at the fact that there's a gap in terms of the number of men and women who are in the sciences. They're going to cover some of the other studies 
in their discussion, but in this particular study, they wanted to use experimental techniques to separate out the hiring practices by faculty um, into evaluating candidates that are identical, ex identical except for their sex, and then look to see if they were systematic, or shall we say, institutional sexist practices that would aggregate up to something like women being underrepresented in the sciences. And they do find that. So their conclusion, and we'll look at it more near the end, is that it's not enough to just keep putting more women students or recruiting women students into the degree schemes if they're not getting hired and they're not being offered salaries on par with their male colleagues, that those practices are what is maintaining a, an imbalance in the, in the sciences as well as an imbalance in the pay differential between men and women doing the same job. So they've done their abstract which summarizes the overview of the article and now we're going to go into the body of the text. The 2012 President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology reported a deficit of a million scientists and engineers and that is what is the gap between what is available and what is needed to meet workforce demands over the next decade. Calls for increased training and retention of women who are currently underrepresented in many field, fields of science is a solution to that deficit. However, there is a persistent disparity between the number of women receiving PhDs and those hired as junior faculty. This gap suggests that the problem will not resolve itself solely by more generations of women moving through the academic pipeline, but that instead women's advancement within academic science may be actively impeded. Evidence suggests that biological sex differences in inherent aptitude for math and science are small or non-existent. Right? So that's the sexual dimorphism argument being chucked out the window at this point, just Christie's note. Research to identify causes of the science gender disparity have focused instead on the life choices that, many, that may compete with women's pursuit of the most demanding positions. Some research suggests that these lifestyle choices, whether free or constrained, likely contribute to the gender imbalance, but because the majority of these studies are correlational, whether lifestyle, lifestyle factors are solely or primarily responsible remains unclear. Stepping out of the reader role, for those of you who are have done my um, How Does Social Science 101, you might remember that one job of social research is to describe reality. Another job of research is to do a causal analysis, what's causing these effects. What the authors are saying in this paragraph, the majority of these studies are correlational. Correlation is a descriptive statistic. It tells you when one thing goes up, so does the other. Or when one thing goes down, the other one does. Or when one thing goes up, something else goes down. That's what correlation is. But it's not an explanation. Explanation requires inferential statistics. And inferential statistics in the regression analysis are eventually used by these authors. So they're setting up what exists in the literature compared to how they are proceeding with this study. So getting back to the text. Still, some researchers have argued that women's preferences for preference for non-science disciplines and their tendency to take on a disproportionate amount of child and family care are the primary causes of the gender disparity in science and that it is, quote, not caused by discrimination in any of these domain, domains, unquote. This assertion has received substantial attention and generated significant debate among the scientific community leading some to conclude that gender discrimination indeed does not exist nor contribute to the gender disparity within academic science. Again, to sum up, what this paragraph and these two paragraphs are saying is because some studies found correlation between women's lifestyles and these professional paths, people are basically blaming women, saying it's women's fault that they're not getting hired. It's women's fault that they're not getting paid more because they choose not to go into the harder, disciplines and they choose not to pursue jobs that pay well. And so what they're summarizing are the arguments that basically say the problem isn't academia, the problem is women. Despite this controversy, experimental research testing for the presence and magnitude of gender discrimination in the biological and physical sciences has yet to be conducted. 
Again, stepping out. That is to say, even though they don't have any data about whether or not sexist hiring practices exist in academia, some people are already saying, oh, look, there aren't any problems with academia because we have these correlation studies that show women, you know, have different lifestyle choices or preferences. And that, therefore, you can't make sensible conclusions. If you don't know if there's actually a problem with sexism, then you can't dismiss that part of the explanation might be sexist hiring practices. So this is what the study aims to evaluate. To what extent are the differences in men and women's representation and salary in the sciences to do with biases on the basis of those people doing the hiring, the faculty who are making the decisions? Although acknowledging that various lifestyle choices likely contribute to the gender imbalance in science, the present research is unique in investigating whether faculty gender bias exists within academic, biological, and physical sciences, and whether it might exert an independent effect on the gender disparity as students progress through the pipeline to careers in science. Now we're going to move on and review the research itself. The experiment examined whether, given an equally qualified male and female student, science faculty would show preferential evaluation and treatment of the male student to work in their laboratory. If faculty express gender biases, we are not suggesting that these biases are intentional or stem from a conscious desire to impede the progress of women in science. Past studies indicate that people's behavior is shaped by implicit or unintended biases stemming from repeated exposure to pervasive cultural stereotypes that portray women as less competent, but simultaneously emphasize their warmth and likability compared with men. Despite significant decreases in overt sexism over the last few decades, particularly among highly educated people, these subtle gender biases are often still held by even the most egalitarian individuals and are exhibited by both men and women. Given this body of work, we expected that female faculty would be just as likely as male faculty to express an unintended, an unintended bias against female undergraduate science students. The fact that these prevalent biases often remain undetected highlights the need for an experimental investigation to determine whether they may be present. Thus, by investigating whether science faculty exhibit a bias that could contribute to the gender disparity within the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, in which objectivity is emphasized, the current study addressed critical theoretical and practical gaps in that it provided an experimental test of faculty discrimination against female students within academic science. Stepping out of the reader rule again, right? What people who mention the words institutional sexism, what they're talking about is not a grand conspiracy theory where people get together and decide not to hire women. It's right along the lines of what these authors are saying, that when an institution has been male-dominated for so long, when women start to move into it, those norms remain. Those, those preferences for male um, leadership and, and the, the way that, you know, we think about the way men operate and women are supposed to be nice but maybe not as competent, right? Because, you know, they're, they're ladies. They, they can't do hard math. That's too tough for them. Like the Barbie, math is hard. All of those stereotypes, even for people who are highly educated and even for women in science who are physically present and know women are capable, the norms that, that set people toward seeing men or a male um, employee or an applicant as being more qualified because he's male exists even within highly educated academic domains. We are not immune from our own unconscious biases. Just being a woman doesn't mean you don't have unconscious biases. Just because you're a man who's very egalitarian and really wants to see a lot of diversity doesn't mean that you um, don't have unconscious biases that filter through your mind. And the way to identify these unconscious biases is through these sorts of studies and to examine systematic patterns so that people reflect back when they're examining the two resumes of equal candidates and one's a man and one's a woman. They go, ah, oh, I think I'm going to go with the guy to go, am I going with the guy because he's a guy? 
Or am I going with the guy because he's really the most competent? If you think that he's competent because of biases, well, then you're just continuing on the pattern that leads to men's preferential hiring over equally qualified women candidates. And then the problem isn't women who aren't going into science or women who aren't applying, it's the gatekeepers, the hiring st committees that are the problem there and maintaining that underrepresentation of women in the sciences. Moving on. Thus, whether aspiring women scientists encounter discrimination from faculty members remains unknown. The formative pre-doctoral pre years are a critical window because students' experiences at this juncture shape both their beliefs about their own abilities and subsequent persistence in science. Therefore, we selected this career stage because it represents an opportunity to address issues that manifest immediately and also resurface much later, potentially contributing to the persistent faculty gender disparity. Now we're going to look, look at the study itself. We investigated whether faculty members' perceptions of student competence would help to explain why they would be less likely to hire a female relative to an identical male student for a laboratory manager position. We examined the role of faculty members' pre-existing subtle biases against women. Pervasive cultural messages regarding women's lack of competence in science could lead faculty members to hold gender-biased attitudes that might subtly affect their support for female, but not male, science students. These generalized, subtly biased attitudes toward women could impel faculty to judge equivalent students different as a function of their gender. I would say sex there because we're talking about aggregates, comparing men and women, but they use gender. Moving on. The present study sought to test for differences in faculty perceptions and treatment of equally qualified men and women pursuing careers in science and, if such a bias were discovered, reveal its mechanisms and consequences within academic science. We focused on hiring for a laboratory manager position as the primary dependent variable of interest because it functions as a professional launching pad for subsequent opportunities. As secondary measures, which are related to hiring, we assessed 1. Perceived student competence, 2. Salary offers, which reflect the extent to which a student is valued for these competitive positions, and 3. The extent to which the student was viewed as deserving of faculty mentoring. Hypotheses Our hypotheses were that Science faculty's perceptions and treatment of students would reveal a gender bias favoring male students in perceptions of competence and hireability, salary conferral, and willingness to mentor, hypothesis A. Faculty gender would not influence this gender bias, hypothesis B. Hiring discrimination against the female student would be mediated i.e. explained by faculty perceptions that a female student is less competent than an identical male student, hypothesis C, and participants' pre-existing subtle bias against women could moderate, i.e. impact, results such that subtle bias against women would be negatively related to evaluation of the female student but unrelated to evaluations of the male student, hypothesis D. A broad, nationwide sample of biology, chemistry, and physics professors, an N of 127, evaluated the application materials of an undergraduate science student who had ostensibly applied for a science laboratory manager position. All participants received the same materials, which were randomly assigned either the name of a male N63 or a female N64 student. Student gender was thus the only variable that differed between conditions. Using previously validated scales, participants rated the student's competence and hireability, as well as the amount of salary and amount of mentoring they would offer the student. Faculty participants believed that their feedback would be shared with the student they had rated. Now we're moving on to the results. The competence, hireability, 
salary conferral, and mentoring scales were each submitted to a two by two, that is a two student gender, male and female, by two faculty gender, male and female, between subjects ANOVA, or anal analysis of variance. In each case, the effect of student gender was significant, whereas the effect of faculty participant gender and their interaction was not. Tests of simple effects indicated that faculty participants viewed the female student as less competent and less hireable than the identical male student. Faculty participants also offered less career mentoring to the female student than to the male student. The mean starting salary offered the female student $26,507.94 was significantly lower than that of the $30,238.10 offered to the male student. These results support hypothesis A. And it is interesting to note that that difference in pay is like around 15 to 17 percent, I think. I'm ballparking that, just kind of eyeballing it. And that's the standard gender gap. Um, you know, that sort of range of 10 percent to 20 percent that women make less than men on average. And the means that were offered to these hypothetical students actually mirror that same gender gap. In support of hypothesis B, faculty gender did not affect bias. Tests of simple effects indicated that female faculty participants did not rate the female student as more competent or hireable than did male faculty. Female faculty also did not offer more mentoring or a higher salary to the female student other than did their male colleagues. In addition, faculty participants' scientific field, age, and tenure status had no effect at all. Thus, the bias appears pervasive among faculty and is not limited to a certain demographic subgroup. And this is really important. People who reject the concept of institutional sexism or racism are ignoring these subtle biases that operate um, you know, on a daily level in, with individual hirings, but happen consistently across departments and across universities. And these consistent um, outcomes that reflect an internal departmental or psychological bias end up producing women not getting hired and therefore being underrepresented in STEM or being offered less money when they do get offered a job. So again, this is, I think, a really important study and they're, it's a very scientific approach. They're looking very precisely at the data and testing theories um, one by one. And for people who want to object to the study, that's fine. But what you shouldn't do is just cite that one blog post that talks about how in psychology um, they had one finding that one-off findings aren't always reproducible. That one-off finding was a one-off finding. It also needs to be reproduced. All scientific findings need to be reproduced. That's part of the scientific process. But if you want to criticize this piece of research, then you have to look at its methodology, its data, its experimental setup. You have to do some actual critical analysis of the research, not just dismiss it based on a blog post. Mediation and moderation analyses. To rigorously examine the processes underscoring faculty gender bias, the authors reverted to standard practices at this point by averaging the standardized salary variable with the competence scale items created uh, to create a robust composite competence variable. This composite competence variable was used in all subsequent mediation and moderation analyses. So what they're saying is they took that information on the salary variable and also how people were rated in terms of their competence and used that to create a composite variable to um, compare how people are rated in terms of their competence and their worth, sort of. Evidence emerged for hypothesis C, the predicted mediation. The initial significant impact of student gender on hireability was reduced in magnitude and dropped to non-significant after accounting for the impact of the student composite competence, which was a strong predictor. That is to say, when they um, tried to predict whether the outcome, the dependent variable here, um, using gender as well as this 
this scale I just described that they, they created, what they found was that gender no longer became significant. So what was really driving the change here was this combination of the perception of competence and the salary, which we know men were rated higher on their competence and men were offered more money. So because there was an extra sexism on top of this, this is what they're trying to get at by looking at the interaction effect as an independent variable from the sex variable of man-woman. And what they're identifying here is that um, this new scale, which talked about was the composite competence scale, is accounting for the difference in the dependent variable. Oh, sorry, I had one more line to read there. This pattern of results provides evidence for full mediation, indicating that the female student was less likely to be hired than the identical male because she was viewed as less competent overall. Results of multiple regression analyses indicated that participants' pre-existing subtle bias against women significantly interacted, and that means statistically significantly, interacted with student gender to predict perceptions of student composite competences, hireability, and mentoring. To interpret these significant interactions, we examined the simple effect separated by student gender. Results revealed that the more pre-existing subtle bias participants exhibited against women, the less comp composite competence and hireability they perceived in the female student, and the less mentoring they were willing to offer her. In contrast, faculty participants' level of pre-existing subtle biases against women were unrelated to the perceptions of the male student's composite competence and hireability and the amount of mentoring they were willing to offer him. Although this effect is marginally significant, its direction su suggests that faculty participants' pre-existing subtle bias against women may actually have made them more inclined to mentor the male student relative to the female student, although this effect should be interpreted with caution because of its marginal significance. Thus, it appears that faculty participants' pre-existing subtle gender bias undermined support for the female student, but it was unrelated to the perceptions and treatment of the male subject. These findings support hypothesis D. Finally, using a previously validated scale, we also measured how much faculty participants liked the student. In keeping with a large body of literature, faculty participants reported liking the female more than the male student. However, consistent with this previous literature, liking the female student more than the male student did not translate into positive perceptions of her composite competence or material outcomes in the form of a job offer, an equitable salary, or valuable career mentoring. Moreover, only composite competence and not likability helped to explain why the female student was less likely to be hired in mediation analyses, student gender condition remained a strong predictor of hireability along with likability. These findings underscore the point that faculty participants did not exhibit outright hostility or dislike toward female students, but were instead affected by pervasive gender stereotypes, unintentional downgrading the competence, hireability, salary, and mentoring of a female student compared with an identical male. The rest of the article I suggest you read. There is a um, discussion section and a conclusion, but the thing I think it's important to take away from this is this, this investigated whether or not women's underrepresentation and systematic pay gaps were on the hiring side of things, not just on women who were going for these jobs, you know, on the women's side of things. And there is some powerful evidence here, as they have demonstrated, that shows that the unconscious biases that are at, at work in people's minds in departments all over the US behave in a consistent way with certain outcomes, that those outcomes disproportionately favor men over women in the case where here people are identic identically qualified because it's the identical resume, just the sex of the person applying is changed. And this is why 
Feminists talk about the social construction of reality. This is why we talk about institutional sexism. It doesn't have to be a grand conspiracy. Even women, when they come into um, institutions that have been dominated by male norms for a very long time, adapt and adopt adapt to and adopt those male norms. And that's why, you know, just being a woman doesn't make it make you magically, um, you know, not subject to the same unconscious biases that men are, are subjected to. That's why this, this data that steps outside of the discussion and does an experiment, double blind experiment, looking at whether or not there's systematic sex differences in hiring is so valuable because this independent information can now be used by departments to make people aware that people around them and maybe even they themselves have an unconscious bias that sees men as more competent and says, oh, you know, um, I liked her a lot, but I don't think she's a good fit. But I don't hate women. You know, some of my best friends are women. She's very nice. She's just not right for this job. How much of that is actually down to her, the qualifications of the candidate? And how much of that is an expression of a subtle bias that prefers men because it sees men as being inherently more competent, regardless of whether or not that's the case? Um, and in this case, of course, they had a control of the, the resume so that we know that it was not the case that the man was more competent um, or that the woman was more competent. They were identical. What was different was the perception of the faculty based on the sex of the applicant. If you guys enjoy this, which I hope you did, let me know in the comments. There are some other bits of social science research that look at things from a feminist critique point um, that look at biases and uh, institutional practices and the ways in which gender norms are constructed in a society and how those constructions have real world impact on people's lives. I guess all that's left to be said is thank you guys for watching all the way to the end of the video. I've been Christy, you've been awesome, thanks for your time and attention, and I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.